Don't change that station while we pause for a brief commercial break. This is TomorrowPictures.tv the story is in the telling. Good afternoon, uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my show. Tonight, uh, this time, I have uh, my favorite guest of all time. He's been on my show three times, uh, and he's the only guest to have another celebrity guest ask for his autograph. That would be Brenda Lee, who asked for his autograph after I interviewed her, and she said, can you get me F. Lee Bailey's autograph on a picture? And my co-host, Robert Baldacci, uh, was able to do that. So, um, Rob, first of all, my co-host, ladies and gentlemen, is Rob Baldacci. Rob, thank you for joining us. Appreciate you setting this up. Uh, ladies my and pleasure, gentlemen, the, the person that I'm about to introduce uh, is, in my opinion, the greatest trial attorney in the history of the United States. Not because of the famous people that he has represented, not because of the incredible success rate that he has had with his trials, but because of his lifetime of accomplishments, he's written over 20 books, including treatises on how to do criminal trials. I used that very treatise, Bailey and Rothblatt, when I first got out of law school. He has produced and hosted many television shows. Motion pictures have been made about his cases and about him. So in my opinion, he's the greatest uh, trial attorney of all time because of his accomplishments, not just because he's famous. Lee. Welcome aboard to my show. Your book is mesmerizing, uh, and it's, it's incredible, but I want to start off. Do you think you'll convince people that heretofore thought he was absolutely guilty? Do you think you might convince people that he was not guilty? I don't know. I've been uh, still a little bit mystified as why people are clinging to a notion as outrageous is the fact that the recent election was stolen uh, because without facts, they're willing to proceed con to conclusions. And this is an age-old American disease of not doing much homework. And so, Lee, you brought up an example that I thought of myself, that not a single judge found any evidence, uh, but they don't care about that. They go, well, I don't care. Now, Donald Trump said that uh, the election was stolen. That's what I'm going to believe. So, uh, well, there's an overlay that goes to explain much of the low quality of this trial, and I, I can use no other word in fairness, and that is California uh, cannot separate out its showtime mentality from the seriousness of a real trial. And so we tend to get this circus atmosphere, and whereas most judges would shut it down pretty quick, they revel in it. And the lawyers go on and on, and pretty soon they're talking about things that have nothing to do with the case, but they're entertaining, and the public is saying, oh, yeah, that's proof of this, this, and that. Well, it's not proof of anything. This is a, a tough business, and not meant to generate a lot of laughs. Rob, go ahead. First of all, thanks for sending uh, me an advanced copy of the book, and I read it. And I think Derry's uh, term, uh, mesmerizing, is so uh, appropriate uh, with this book, Lee. Really, uh, it really takes the reader behind the scenes of what is perhaps one of the most uh, controversial uh, 
uh, cases in American history, at least in the 20th century. And, it, and it's, uh, and the reader will learn a lot of information and facts that uh, were never told. And no one had any idea exactly what was going on behind the scenes, the evidence that was admitted, the evidence that was not admitted. Uh, and I, and it starts with the sort of the, what, what, what do you call it? The pre-trial uh, hearing, Lee? Where uh, preliminary hearing, yeah. correct. <clears throat> preliminary hearing where uh, that judge made a determination to uh, turn OJ over for a trial, and uh, but certain information was left out. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that and what set the stage sure. for the uh, sure. Judge Ito? Uh, Unfortunately, and I'm not pulling any punches here, Bob Shapiro had control of this case in the critical early days and the enormity of his mistakes began to accumulate. First of all, he attempted to give OJ a polygraph test at a time when the subject is not testable. No responsible examiner would take a guy who had lost a loved one, whether he did it or not, and try to test him for about 10 days, two weeks, and the examiner told Bob that. But Bob went ahead and created at least a rumor that R.J. had flunked. That's a bad way to start out with the presumption of innocence. Then, instead of investigating immediately something terribly suspicious, how did that glove get from the scene of the murder, where it certainly was, to O.J.'s house, and why was it still wet at 6 in the morning? That's enough to light fires in the brain of even a dull defense lawyer. Shapiro missed it. And so the judge had no benefit of the fact that this guy, Furman, was a racist and a little cockeyed in other ways and no reason to give him the doubt. She accepted it at face value. She was a pretty good judge. And I think given a better insight into what the facts were, this case might have been shut down and the police might have gone back to investigating what to me is a not routine, but certainly not extraordinary drug related killing. Problem was they got the wrong victim. Right, right. Uh, uh, Lee, one of the things that you mentioned in the book, which I find incredible, that Shapiro did not pick up on, and that was that Ito's wife was a high ranking police officer, and he offered or suggested that he could be recused and Shapiro kept him on the bench just because he quote liked him and the first thing any criminal attorney knows is you would never have a judge on the bench listening to witnesses from the LAPD so that was a crucial error in itself having Ido in the trial am I correct? Oh this is a terrible error and I remonstrated with him at the time I said Bob what are you thinking? This guy's got his head on the pillow next to law enforcement every night and comes in here to make impartial rulings with the whole LAPD, depending upon him to save their face by making this look like a case. And he said, Ito loves me. Well, Ito didn't love him. And to drive the spike home, Bob, I think inadvertently, I think his vocabulary just didn't stretch this far. He called Ito disingenuous. Well, that word means liar. Indeed, a federal judge called Bill Barr disingenuous um, in some proceedings a short time ago, and the world understands the term. But Bob didn't. And Ito almost put him in jail. Nonetheless, I watched Ito very closely, and at one time I said to him, you're doing a very good job, but he was. And I knew there was a tension uh, that he had to go home and answer to Captain York at night, and uh, and th that the police department expected him when it was a close call to lean that way, and eventually he buckled, and the trial I think disintegrated as that happened. The ironic thing is, once again, not doing your homework, and Edo's offer to step down and accept it. The next guy in line who would have inherited the case was probably the best judge on the Superior Court bench in the county, 
Paul Flynn, at least that's what all of the lawyers out there told me. And a good judge could have made mincemeat of this case as it should have been. I had lunch with the federal judge who sentenced Timothy McVeigh to death for the Oklahoma City bombings, Richard Mage, a cowboy who had two sex guns and wasn't afraid to use them. And I said, Judge, if you had this case, how long before you put the first lawyer in jail for talking too much? He said, three weeks. <laughs> Rob, go ahead. I, I think uh, <laughs> Furman, in, in your handling of Furman, is, is probably one of the classic cases of a cross-examination that, that I've ever seen. And I'm yes. sure you'd agree. Agreed, Rob. And uh, people can watch it uh, on YouTube. But you, you brought up the issue of Furman and had uh, your uh, investigator, Pat McKenna, uh, check out his background. And apparently he, wa he wanted to, uh, or, or he did file suit to, uh, to be removed uh, as a detective uh, in LA, given his, his feelings uh, toward the minority community. And what happened, that was early on, Lee, what happened with that? Uh, well, information. The, the sequence is this, and it's tragic. You're quite right. McKenna was not on the scene, nor were any of my people before the preliminary hearing. I pulled into town the night before, and Shapiro had arranged me to watch it by remote control. He didn't want me showing up in the courtroom and deflecting some of the sunlight that was suddenly shining on this lawyer who never tried law. He went around and pleaded cases. It was two magazines, I'm sorry to say, not our detectives who discovered that Furman had a history of racial prejudice and had indeed applied for early retirement on the ground that he had trouble controlling himself with minorities, especially youngsters. The New York Magazine and The New Yorker were Newsweek, and I believe The New Yorker both broke this at once. And then we descended on it and get the records and said, oh my goodness, this guy has propelled this case into a trial posture in the Superior Court and he's wacko. And he just wanted to stay in the case. And as he said on tape later on, a few days later when the lady he was working with the movie script said, aren't they gonna can you for this? He said, they can't can me. This is a case about a glove. I am the glove. If the glove goes out, the case goes bye-bye. Never were true words spoken. It's a case about a glove, because he put it there, and I'm convinced of that, even though I don't have a video of him doing so. You, in your book, give the four reasons, four elements of why we could find it not guilty by reasonable doubt. Number one is the timeline, the fact that it would have had to be accomplished in such a uh, quick period. Number two, his demeanor at various times on the plane, off the plane. Um, uh, thirdly, motive. The motive was not big enough. He'd uh, seen his wife with other men before, including in a very compromising position. And lastly, the statement that he gave at the beginning where he knew nothing about it. Of all those four, can you tell me which one you think is the most important? By far the timeline, and that's the one the jury used to eclipse the case because the beginning element of any criminal proceeding is a demonstration that the accused had the opportunity to commit the crime without the opportunity or a conspiracy where he's controlling it from some remote position, he's out. And OJ, if you took the places that we could put him and the people that we could put on the scene where O.J. was not eclipsed the possibility that he could have committed these murders, hidden the evidence, and gotten ready, freshly showered, to hop in a limousine to go play golf in Chicago. And the jury, as I clocked it back out, because there was some delay here, press said it took four hours to reach a verdict. They had a verdict in 53 minutes, oh. and probably prior to that, except that the demon, who was one of the few white people in the jury, Caucasian, uh, and very obviously not a fan of OJ's, 
She held it up by saying we need to make sure the limousine driver didn't see anyone run into the house when OJ would have to have been running into the house. The limousine driver said, absolutely not. I had my headlights on. They covered the driveway. Nobody moved in the house till I saw OJ come out of the house. At that point, the jurors had been told, you sit and listen to all the testimony, not just some part of it. They got up and walked out. They called for verdict forms, and eight minutes later, we had two verdicts. That was enough for me. I went and told the press, you've got an acquittal, and the press is saying, how much time do you think you'll get? It'd be lucky you won't get the chair. Then I go into the prison and said to OJ, you know, I have good news for you, and that is my expert conclusion, in this case, close to infallible, that you better quit it, but you're grinning already. Who told you? He <laughs> said, every bailiff has asked me for an autograph for the now this would be his last chance to get it. But that doesn't mean you're good at the who's got. Rob, uh, Rob and Lee, I have to tell you, Lee, I had a $600 bet on this trial that he would be found not guilty. When the person I bet with called me and said, guess what, Derry? They came back in four hours. I said, then quadruple the bet. Because <laughs> I knew if they'd come back in four hours, it was not going to be a guilty verdict. And now you're telling us it wasn't four hours. It was 56 minutes. Rob, go ahead. Lee, uh Again, this is absolutely fascinating, and, and I'm so happy that you were able to uh, come out with this book uh, to set the record straight. And hopefully uh, some of our mainstream media friends uh, will pick up on this and, and start to present a different case to the American people uh, based, on, based on this book. Uh, but you, I, your comments regarding uh, Shapiro are are well known, uh, you, the incompetence uh, speaks for itself. Talk a little bit about how uh, Johnny Cochran got involved and how he sh helped to shape the case. Uh, was this the first time you had met Johnny? Yes, um, Johnny Cochran had been a prosecutor in the DA's office uh, with some distinction for a period of time, went into private practice and made a specialty of suing cops for abusing minorities, and had been quite successful, and was very popular. He was very well-spoken. His father was a preacher, as Johnny was intended to be, and his handling of the language within his genre was to be admired. Indeed, I went in West Palm Beach to hear him preach at the famous black church down there, one of the few, few white people invited. and I. Uh, I'm pretty tough when it comes to critiquing people's handling of the English language, because I think most people don't handle it very well. But Johnny did. Uh, the case occurred in Santa Monica, and ordinarily would have been tried there in the white community with plenty of money. But bear in mind, O.J. was a quasi-part of that community. He was a light-skinned black who had set the all-time record in the NFL for rushing, uh, he was a sometime actor, didn't win any Oscars. He ran through airports for Hertz, and he did sportscasting from the sidelines. And he was extremely popular, um, had a great time with the ladies. No reason to think that he would get upset over his wife and knock her off. I'd have been happy had the first case been tried in Santa Monica. Garcetti was still reeling from the Rodney King episode and they had made a mistake they tried the cops in rodney king the first time in simi valley well simi valley is about four steps to the right of Genghis khan and that was a bad job if ever i saw it they all get acquitted the feds come in and charge them and convict them and put them away and garcetti got roundly criticized so he said, well, I'll take this case downtown where the minorities will be on the jury and I'll avoid that criticism. Also, much more convenient to have the trial in the building where his office was located. When it was moved downtown, and OJ had always said to Chappelle, look, I'm hiring you to try and stop this thing. Don't ever get any illusions. I want you to try it. 
You've never tried a murder case. Um, he, 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 OJ was very sharp and he retained information well. Sometimes he got too full of himself, as he did in Las Vegas, and decided what the law should be and acted as though it were. But during the trial, I must say he was an ideal client. And he said, if we're going to be downtown, we need Johnny Cochran. They approached Johnny. Johnny said, no, Michael Jackson doesn't want me to defend you because he doesn't want to be associated with you. He's got enough trouble as it is. And he turned the case down. And they kept the pressure on. And finally, they said the greater good will be to defend O.J. Simpson. And so Johnny withdrew from Michael Jackson and took the case. Now, I was already in it. And when he took over, I had lunch with him. I said, Johnny, I would brought in here to hog tie Furman and throw him in a corner. If you're not comfortable doing that, I don't like California. I don't like traveling 2,000 miles every time I have to come out here. And I'm perfectly happy to disappear from this case and let you handle it. And he said, oh, no, I want you to cross-examine Furman. Well, um, that eventuated into the most miserable years of my life because, oddly enough, and most defense lawyers are recognized for doing the job they're required to do, and that's put up the defense. Indeed, Felix Frankfurter once said in the Supreme Court, a measure of a culture's worth is the way it treats its worst citizens. How fair a trial can you give a monster? Um, and I had skated through the Boston Strangler, killed 13 women for reasons we as yet don't understand, and some other pretty scary people without ever getting uh, any mud slung on my house or my car or my person. But O.J. was different. O.J. said, wait a minute. He did it. He's going to get away with it. And Bailey will be the guy that helps him get away with it. And I got treated that way throughout the trial. But more importantly, after the trial, Cochran and his community was a hero. And Johnny, within his ambit, did a good job. Now, if he cross-examined in one of my cases, the way he did at OJ, I would have said, Johnny, this is not a country hold-down. This is where you live despite the witness. And uh, Johnny was all smiles, and, but he was affected. And between us, I think... We got the worst of the witnesses uh, pretty well hogtied and neutralized. And so it was a good working team. I liked the man more than almost any lawyer I've ever worked with. I have never worked a case before where I was anything but lead counsel or co-lead counsel. I'm a Marine. I'm in the habit of giving orders, not taking them. Because if you fly a single legend jet, you better give the orders. There's nobody there to give you advice <laughs> in case you're screwed up. So it, it's a way of exercising your profession. And with one huge exception, where we did all but come to blows, Johnny and I never had a quarrel in nine months. And I found that to be a, a wonderful measure of equanimity between two professionals of totally different backgrounds totally different origins and even cultures melding together to make a single effective force. That part of it was a joy. The rest of it, you could take the O.J. Simpson case and flush it down the toilet. <laughs> I wish I'd never been involved in it, but if I had to do it again, I would because I am convinced that O.J. had nothing to do with these murders, was totally a victim of all kinds of bad things the after slush of the Rodney King debacle, the LAPD, which insists on being a sewer no matter how many times we cleared it out, and other factors that just make this an unpleasant memory. Nonetheless, you can't believe that someone's being falsely accused of a murder this monstrous and sit back and do nothing about it. Even if I'd known... I was going to take a pasting, get chased out by a uh, crooked uh, cracker federal judge. 
from Alabama who was sitting in Florida and uh, put me in jail by a bar association that had the cojones of a stud field mouse. And <laughs> <laughs> right on down the line, oh, don't laugh, your bar association main fell in step by hair. But they did. They just couldn't be big enough to let me in. And thank goodness, um, I have my own club. I don't let them in. Uh, Lee, um, Lee. It's an experience that most lawyers would crumble over. And I thought about that. And I said, the hell with it. If the world is out of step with Johnny, you reverse that. I'm Johnny. Uh, the other guys are all wrong. Uh, Lee. Uh, we didn't have to ask a single question. I wish you could be a little more eloquent. I'm, no, I am enjoying this so much. Lee, one of the things that, that Johnny did was, uh, as you put in your book, Bailey and Rothblatt, you tell the jury, uh, you suggest to them their reasonable doubts, and he gave them 15 questions that Marsha Clark did not answer. Uh, and that's exactly what he did. E except you, told, you said in your book that the jury... They, they reached their conclusions not just because of the 15 questions that John had, but because they were actually listening to the evidence. Is that correct? I, I did give him a list of questions I thought she would have trouble with. And he asked some of them. But it didn't pin her. If you're going to use that technique, it's like taking a moth and sticking a pin on it. You can't let it move and wiggle. And Marsha Clark could wiggle as any question. If you asked her if she was a female, she'd say yes. <laughs> go ahead, Rob. That's, go ahead, Rob. No, I mean this is this has been uh, this has been enjoyable, and it's and it's good to see you, Lee, in in uh, good health. I'm glad you're you're back home and uh, and ready to you know hit the ground running here. You've got a great book, and uh, and I and I wish you a lot of success with it. Uh, your point about uh, Lee, your point about uh, how this case has impacted you uh, since, and the uh, the animosity that some people have have uh, shown, the fact that everybody think you know who, who thinks that uh, OJ did, was innocent is nuts, and that seems to be the prevailing uh, sentiment. Uh, there were there have been TV shows, movies, uh, you name it. Uh, that have uh, only solidified that. Uh, so, and, and you, you raised the point about, uh, and this is a main TV show, uh, the main bar, and I was, I was with you every step of the way there, and I think it's one of the real tra travesties of this state. I, I agree, Rob. That, I'm going to uh, interrupt. Rob, I'm going to interrupt. Ahead. I'm going to interrupt because we got to close. Rob, you're closing on a note that I would have closed on. In my Go opinion, ahead. I surely wish that F. Lee Bailey was a brother of the bar with me. It didn't happen. Yes. We can move on. Uh, Peter Detroit did a great job. Chief, Chief Justice Softly wrote a fantastic dissent. Lee, I yep. cannot thank you enough for being on this show. You are my favorite guest of all time. You're the greatest lawyer in American history. Thank you for being with us. Rob, thank you for setting it up. And folks, we'll see you the next time. Thank you. L.A. back in your own backyard. Tomorrow Pictures. It happened in Monterey. The story is in the telling. This is TomorrowPictures.tv. This is TomorrowPictures.tv.